The play today is Coriolanus, and let me begin again by seeing for how many of you this is a new experience, the reading of Coriolanus. How many have you, have you have read it before, seen it performed? Good, okay. Uh, uh, this is a play uh, which has come in for an enormous amount of critical attention in the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, it's uh, the, and, I, and I'm gonna go through uh, with you for just a second or two, some kinds of approaches that people have taken to this play, uh, just to suggest to you how capacious it is and how powerful it is as a play. This is the play famously that T.S. Eliot in his essay called Hamlet and His Problems said was a better play than Hamlet, a more successful play than Hamlet. And he wasn't joking, really. I mean, he, he, it's, it's not that he thought it was a greater play than Hamlet, but he felt that it set out its premises better and fulfilled them more effectively. Uh, there, uh, Harry Levin, in uh, a discussion of this play, uh, felt also that this was one of the greatest of Shakespeare's plays, uh, and a play that uh, should have the richest meaning in our time as he said, writing as early as 1934. This may strike you as rather terrifyingly prescient uh, in terms of uh, what was about to happen in Europe in the mid to late 30s. Certainly people have read this play as a play about tyranny, about dictatorship, about individuality, about, uh, and it's been read, as I, I, I explained in my, my chapter, uh, from, from every possible political point of view. It's been read with the idea of, of the oligarchy at the center. It's been read with the idea of the heroic individual at the center as a, a, a reading focused on the figure of Coriolanus himself. It's been read as a, as a play focused upon the people called in this, this text, as you will have noticed, very often voices. Uh, Bertolt Brecht famously rewrote some scenes from this play so as to emphasize the degree to which the people were, he thought, the main characters of the play. Uh, and the, 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 the politics of the play are far from secure. That is to say, uh, it has been read very effectively from almost every possible political position. Uh, it won't surprise you, having discussed other plays here in the last several weeks, to see that, that, that various feminist readings of this play were also very available to readers in the latter half of the 20th century, with this very strong figure of Volumnia, the mother of Coriolanus, uh, who has also occasioned very powerful and differing psychoanalytic readings of the play, uh, depending upon whether you think that she's a, a, a good enough mother, to use Winnicott's phrase, or whether she's the kind of mother who, who denies food and sustenance, sustenance sorry, to her son. Uh, her, certainly she is in the, in the line that we've begun to see of very strong, powerful women in these later plays. Uh, Lady Macbeth, Goneril and Regan, uh, the, 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 this figure of Volumnia may be the most powerful and successful of them all, and certainly the most dominant with respect to her child. You'll notice that this is a play which, uh, unlike some other plays that we've looked at, which have fathers, no wives, and daughters, here we have a mother, no husband, and a son, and the reversal of that trajectory here carries with it its own power. It's a play that's also been looked at from the perspective of philosophical skepticism, uh, significantly in readings, for example, by Stanley Cavell. And it's been looked at as a play about speech and speech acts, uh, about the degree to which words are deeds, the degree to which, remember that a speech act, especially a performative speech act, is a speech, is, is a, a piece of speech that does something as well as saying something, as well as declaring something. Uh, and in this case, the, the, the 
various modes of declaration in this play, from uh, the, the claims of banishment on both sides to the renaming of Coriolanus and the unnaming of Coriolanus all have, have real power for somebody who wants to look at speech act theory in connection with a play, which is not usually where speech act is, is, is examined. Uh, most recently, this play has also uh, entered into a lot of, as you can guess from reading its, uh, its text, a lot of conversations among critics about the body, about gender and the body, about the openness and closedness of the body, about, the, about, about embodiment altogether, and the capacity or incapacity of the body itself to speak, uh, whether we're talking about Meninius' fable of the belly on the one hand, the sort of parts of the body all speaking, and we'll want to talk about that more explicitly, or about the, the inability, the apparent inability, the splenetic inability of Coriolanus himself to be an eloquent speaker and what that says and does uh, in the course of the play. The uh, recent political readings have been extremely interested in questions of republicanism uh, in, the, in the, the civic sense, not American Republicans and Democrats, but the notion of Republican rule and what that has to do with this text, uh, and have taken very seriously uh, the kind of political models that it is presenting out of classical history and what lessons might or might not have been learned from those models by 17th century <coughs> political theorists. Uh, there have also been historical readings and interesting historical readings that have tried to look at the fact that the history being remembered and enacted in this play, like, for example, the, the hunger of the plebeians, of the citizens at the beginning of the play, their, their desire for corn, for food, uh, their unwillingness to be fed with words instead, would have echoed the corn riots of the early 17th century uh, in the Midlands and England, would have had, therefore, a kind of topical reference, just as the, this uh, terrifying, very strong maternal figure who dominates and motivates or emasculates or does both, perhaps, to her heroic son uh, could have been looked at as a figure for the, the uh, what John Knox in an earlier treatise called the monstrous regiment of women, the, the terrifying regiment here meaning rule, the rule by women and the degree to which being ruled by women was itself a monstrosity because a world turned upside down, whether the woman being imagined as ruling was the recently, relatively recently deceased Queen Elizabeth, uh, James I's mother, Mary Queen of Scots, beheaded in the 1580s, uh, or the various women still on thrones and in power uh, throughout England. So that the, the historical readings, as always, with a play like this, uh, touch upon many different historical moments. The, the historical moment in which the history of Coriolanus took place in classical Rome, the historical moment in which Shakespeare was writing the play and it was being produced, the historical moment in which Variously, the play has been read, interpreted, produced, enacted. Uh, one last word uh, just along these lines. Uh, the productions I have seen fairly recently of this play have tended to emphasize this multi-historicity by often having costumes from different time periods so that you might have a gladiator and a doughboy and a, 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 a somebody in Vietnam camouflage and so forth, so that you'd, and, a, and a, a red coat, so that you'd have a whole sedimented series of different historical modes of soldiering or of other kinds of costuming, so that rather than picking an historical period into which to produce the play, to produce it as a play about. Uh, the end of World War II, or as a play about Vietnam, or as a play uh, about ancient Rome, you might produce it, as it often has been produced recently, as a play about all wars at all times, and about what it means to be uh, 
a hero or uh, a figure pushed into the position of a hero uh, who recognizes or doesn't recognize his own hollowness in that regard. Uh, so this is just to give you some very broad overview of the kind of cultural impact that this play has had uh, on the last century or century and a half. Uh, before we turn to talking about specific portions of the play, uh, let me turn to you to see what you might want to say about these historical and critical intersections. Are you all dying of the heat, may I ask? It's, it's, yes. You don't think it's on? I, I see. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, let's see which one it is. Um, better? Believe me, it's equally warm up here. <laughs> okay, so shall I say all that all over again? Uh, were you in the hall able to hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, good. We have someone making a call, too, so we can turn it down. Okay, but maybe the call could be made outside the room. Thanks so much. I think, you know, where are we? The uh, 14th of November, I think the expectation was of a different kind of climactic, climatic moment, a different climactic moment uh, from what we actually have. So questions, comments about, about, about the broad his historical or interpretive sweep of this play? Yes? Wait, wait, we have to wait for the microphone. I'm, I read a lot of, uh, have recently read a fair amount of... Speak into the microphone, sir. I've recently read some, uh, some Homer and Sophocles, and I'm astonished by the, by the intensity with which Shakespeare recreates the, uh, the classical ideal uh, that you find in, 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 in uh, things like the, the, the end of the Iliad where Achilles turns into a, a machine of death or uh, uh, figures like Ajax in the so in Sophocles, who rejects all of, tries to reject all of his family ties. It's just, it's just astonishing the way he recreates that uh, that, uh, that classical feeling. Well, uh, let's let's let, let me try to un thank you very much for that. Let, let me try to unpack that a little bit. Um, the, when we say recreates, we may not mean imitates or even is familiar with the classical original but reinvents for his own age. That's the one thing I would say about that. And the other thing I would say is that we're looking at this from our own perspective, that these are our own notions of what this classical heritage might be like. And to a certain extent, that our taste in these things is shaped by Shakespeare, that, it's, uh, that, that our notion about what, what uh, what kinds of, I mean, because when we're dealing with the classics, we're dealing with translations, presumably. We're dealing, again, with, with, a, with modern writers rewriting uh, ancient texts. So, so let's, let's, let's put a little pressure on this question of classical ideals or classical notions. Yeah, Gabe. Uh, is there anything anachronistic about the uh, the weeping that becomes so important at the end? Uh, I mean, in the classical, like in classical Greece, um, uh, it wasn't considered un unmanly for a man to to weep, to shed tears. Well, we've had, thank you for this question. That, that we've had a number of cases uh, in the last several weeks in which Shakespearean men have resisted weeping and then have wept or been invited to weep. 
Uh, and in, in those cases have actually functioned a little bit differently from this moment where, this is the moment where Ophidius says, thou boy of tears. Now, it's not clear that he is weeping rather than just having a kind of a tantrum. Um, yes? I thought it referred to the, the uh, tears that he shed in his conversation. Uh, did it, that refer to the tears that he'd shed in his conversation with Volonia in, in a few scenes earlier? Well, the, 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 the reconciliation scene right. between them, yes. It, I, I, that could be. That could, that could well be. The, and, and in that case, the so-called unmanning is, again, his, his uh, uh, submission to the will of a woman, in this case his, his mother, but, but never mind. But remember, King Lear with don't let women's weapons, water drops, stain my man's cheeks, and then, then the storm weeps for him and so forth. And then, then uh, when he awakens, the question again is who is weeping? Is he weeping or is Cordelia weeping? Uh, and the uh, much discourse in that play about tears. The uh, Macduff at the end of, of Macbeth, we talked about this a little bit, the degree to which he pulls his hat over his brows, or at least so says his interlocutor, uh, and he doesn't want to weep, uh, and he is told to give sorrow its way, and in fact that, that, that weeping, uh, while he thinks of it as a womanish activity, uh, could also be a manly one. So this question, tears are very important in these texts, and this question of, of whether you uh, can, uh, so, so, the, so let's look at the taunt, for example, thou boy of tears. Uh, how, hello, um, how might Coriolanus have responded to that as a figure? How does he receive it and how might he receive it? Remember, this is, this is in, we were starting at the end of the play, but we, 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 can, we can start here and then go backward. Because this is the, the, the stripping scene, basically. This is the scene of the, 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 the removal from Coriolanus of the carapace of various social honors and especially names that he has accumulated up to this time and that really function for him as a protection against uh, a, a, a confrontation with himself, that he, he develops a whole series of, of names and of identities, and then Ophidius very cannily begins to strip him of them toward the end, uh, and uh, the, the, the first name to go is Coriolanus, and then he says, my name is Martius, name not the god, thou boy of tears, that, so that, that all of these public names and all of these names that have to do with a certain kind of heroism, uh, Ophidius is attacking him by, by uh, uh, subtracting, uh, leaving him back in the position uh, in which he very much does not want to be, that is the position of the boy with respect to his mother. Sir, wait, you want to wait for the... He responds with anger, uh, uh, rebuking them, uh, and basically not uh, yielding in any way. Yeah, I mean, there, so there's no moment of recognition on his part at that. There, there's no accommodation as there. And for mo most of these characters, there is, in fact, that not, not an accommodation of the idea that, that uh, weeping is part of the human rather than part of the defended masculine here. Uh, and that's, that, that's, that's how weeping seems to be functioning in these plays as a, I mean, it's either a, uh, an activity coded female or an activity coded not male or not heroic or, but this, this speaks again to this question of the openness of the male body here, that one of the ways in which he would be open would be that, the, 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 that his tears would flow, that he would not be defended or contained against that. And again, much of the recent criticism about Coriolanus has talked about his openness rather than his closedness as a, as a good thing, as a powerful thing. Let's, let's start, let's, let's uh, return maybe a little bit to the chronology of the play in order to see how he gets back to that position, if we can. Uh, it's, this is, uh, as with so many of the plays that we've looked at again, uh, we hear a lot about the title character before we encounter him. We, we're, we're, the situation is developing 
without him, and then he appears into it. What is happening at the very beginning of this play? Yes. Some of the citizens are speaking. Wait, wait, Some of the citizens are speaking, and uh, they feel they're starving, and nobody's caring for them, and that uh, Coriolanus um, has no interest in their welfare. And Remember, he's not yet Coriolanus, of course. He's Caius Martius, right. okay? Um, and that what he did, he did for his own pride. So they have an opinion about him, and their opinion about him is, I mean, this is contrary to what we saw at the beginning of Antony Cleopatra, where you heard uh, rather grandiose statements about uh, the, the heroes, and then they appeared, and they were being measured against images of their own greatness, so to speak. Uh, in, and, and with Troilus and Cressida, you may recall, uh, those characters were for us being measured against their cultural reputation, which had preceded them, although they were, were, were unaware of that. Uh, in this case, Martius has a reputation, and it is a, an, an indigenous reputation, a reputation within Rome, uh, and among the citizens, so-called, uh, uh, they're not fans of his. They're not supporters of his. Why are these characters called citizens, incidentally? You know, I suppose in a way they're faceless. Um, they're not individuals to him. They're sort of a mob. They're they're um, a group which you can't trust in battle. You can't trust in the street. Um, and they they talk as one. Um, they, you know, they talk in individual voices, but it's all the same to him. The, uh, but citizen citizen also would have had, as the name implies, a certain kind of ci uh, uh, civic. Association. It was a word which, in Shakespeare's own time, uh, uh, referred to the residents of London, for example. It's a it's a, 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 a low social rather than a middling sort or a high social location, um, and it's it suggests from the very beginning a kind of commonality between the historical circumstance that we're looking at and maybe the current day circumstance in which the play itself. One, one question in there. Um, on the other side, um, Coriolanus, is, is there a soldier ideal there, or what is the other? I mean, the great person in Rome is purely a, a great soldier, a great man in battle, or is there something beyond that in terms of political? Um, I'm sorry, are you asking me about in the time of Coriolanus? Yeah, or? I mean, is the soldier ideal the, the main ideal for the, for the Senate or for the, for the noble. Well, this is so very, very, noble. very early in the history of Rome. This yeah. is not, this is the, the, this is. No, but there are war all the time and everything. Right. Is that the only ideal, um, is there a ruler for him? I mean, is the, is the, the soldier idea? Well, let's ideal? look at the modes of manhood that the play actually presents us with. It pre prevents, uh, presents us with generals and with, with, uh, with, uh, whether it's Comenius or uh, Coriolanus, Mar Gaius Martius, or Ophidius, the Volscian general. Uh, what other modes of manhood does the play suggest to us? There are the senators um, who are um, kind of elder statesmen um, in, in addition to the generals. So there, there is another way. And some people like um, Cominius seem to combine, be able to combine both roles. Uh, yeah, well, Cominius Com has, uh, has a public persona, uh, which, which is exactly what K.S. Martius doesn't want to have. But again, it's based upon his being a good general. Uh, so that, that's, those are the, the other figure that we see, of course, at the beginning, and the figure that we're about to see in this scene is Menenius, who occupies a very different social space, who, who is uh, old, wordy, um, uh, skilled politician, uh, powerful for reasons that have very little to do with with uh, st uh, with, with uh, Warcraft per se, uh, but who's also vulnerable for that reason. Uh, so I think all that we can do in looking at a play like this is to see what kinds of models the play itself presents for us, because or whether by allusion or by representation, 
that because otherwise we we uh, since we're 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 not talking about real ancient Rome and we're only trying to imagine what the belief structures were, the historical structures were in Shakespeare's England. Uh, we, we have no way of verifying these models except to see how, the, how they are, they're structured here. Uh, but the opening scene gives us, I think, a very good sense of, of how that, that those issues are posed uh, because these dissentious rogues, as, as Martius will then call them, uh, who have, it's arguable, a very good case to make that they are starving, that they need support, that they need food and so forth, are about to be managed politically. And they're about to be managed by Menenius with his fable of the body. Um, and the, the, what, very briefly, somebody kind of summarized for us what the fable of the body or the fable of the belly is here. Yes. He uh, tells the story about how all the other organs in the body mutinize against the <coughs> stomach or the belly. I'm assuming it's the same thing. And then he goes on to say that uh, the belly provides, you know, the nutrition for the rest of the body. So even if you don't see it, or they don't, the organs of the right. body don't see it, whatever. So then he makes the comparison to um, the belly being the the center of Rome, the, um, the consul or whatever, and mm -hmm. then the rest of the body parts being these ungrateful other body parts who right. don't see the connection. Right, right. Uh, this is, uh, you will all know, uh, not an original thought with Shakespeare. It is brilliantly brought to life by Shakespeare, uh, but this is an old political theoretical notion about the body politic, about exa exactly the idea of the working together of these body parts. Uh, this, the, uh, the, the theory of the body politic, so-called, uh, begins with this kind of metaphor, and the body is an actual player in the notion of the body politic. That's the kind of metaphor that we, where we've forgotten to a certain extent the fact that it was a metaphor to begin with, but it's something that shows up in Livy. Uh, it is then retranslated in, in, by, by, by uh, political theorists in Shakespeare's day. Uh, he's working very much with a familiar image of the body um, and uh, with, with notions about natural and political discourse here. Uh, the, what's, what the genius of the Shakespearean representation of it is it is like an animated cartoon, uh, as the uh, Menenius himself notices very well. Look, you, I can make the belly smile as well as speak. That that this this rather somber anatomical description uh, comes to life, uh, and and he's uh, and it, think of it as I mean think of it like, like B movie. Where these bees are speaking about, about, about the hive and so forth. Again, uh, if my, my reading of the reviews is correct, these are all you know male bees in a society which is in fact an entirely female society. But the, so the fable of the bees is here remade for a modern social world, uh, which unreflectively imagines that that you know young persons going out into the world are normatively male rather than normatively female, and the power structure in B movie uh, is male, even though. The, whole hive is, in fact, apiologically, so to speak, female. So here, too, uh, you have an image of the body, uh, which is like an animated cartoon, in which uh, Menenius is able to tweak the inherited uh, body discourse in order to both entertain them and also calm them and, and, and disarm them. Uh, let's let's look a little bit more closely at the text here. Uh, see how this works. About Act One, Scene One, about line ninety-five. There was a time when all the body's members rebelled against the belly, thus accused it that only like a gulf it did remain in the midst of the body, idle and you know unactive, still cupboarding the viands, still storing up food, never bearing like labor with the rest where the other instruments did see and hear, devise, instruct, walk, feel, and mutually participate, did minister unto the appetite and affection common of the whole body. So the complaint of these other members is the belly does nothing. 
Uh, the belly answered, first and said, well, sir, what answer made the belly? Uh, sir, I shall tell you. With a kind of smile, which ne'er came from the lungs, but even thus, so it's not like a burp, it's not like an in inadvertent smile, it's a, a deliberate smile. For look you, I may make the belly smile as well as speak. It tauntingly replied to the discontented members. Notice that this word members here is playing a dual role, that it means body parts, members of, you know, the hands as members and the feet as members and so forth. And it also means social members. <clears throat> the mutinous parts that envy his receipt, that is what the, stump, the belly receives, even so most fitly as you malign our senators for that they are not such as you. So he's going to punctuate this fable with some moral interpretation, in case anybody's not getting it. Uh, first citizen, your belly's answer, what? The kingly crowned head, the vigilant eye, the counselor heart, the arm, our soldier, our steed, the leg. Now again, these are all uh, the equivalents, this is the signifier and the signify, these are equivalents that seem to work. Our leg is like a steed, the heart is like a counselor, the arm is like a soldier. In, in, these, these, in this, his retelling of the fable of the body as the first citizen understands it, all these parts have these noble roles. The tongue, our trumpeter, with other muniments and petty helps in this our fabric, if that they... What then? For me, this fellow speaks. What then? What then? So he's making fun of the way in which the fable is being taken over by the first citizen. The former agents, I'm skipping a line or two, if they did complain, what could the belly answer? I will tell you, says Meninius, if you'll bestow a small of what you have little patience a while, you just hear the belly's answer. First citizen, you're long about it. Note me this, good friend. Your most grave belly was deliberate, not rash like his accusers, and thus answered. Now, once you look at words like rash, you need patience and so forth, because these are his, his critiques of the citizens. But they're very shortly going to be critiques that could easily be made about Martius. True it is, my incorporate friends, quoth he, that I receive the general food at first, which you do live upon, and fit it is, because I am the storehouse and the shop of the whole body. But if you do remember, I send it through the rivers of your blood, even to the court, the heart, to the seat of the brain. And through the cranks and offices of man, the strongest nerves and small inferior veins from me receive that natural competency wherein they live. And though that all at once, you good, my, good, my, my, my good friends, this says the belly, mark me. That is to say, I'm not telling you this. This is, you know, my story only. I sir, well, well. Though all at once cannot see what I do deliver out to each, yet I can make my audit up, that all from me do back receive the flower of all and leave me from the, but the brand. What say you to it? What do you think about this little narrative? It was an answer. How apply you this? So here's, here's remember I talked to you a couple weeks ago about emblems in the English Renaissance and, and books of emblems in which there was a picture, there was a moral, and then there was a poem that extrapolated it. So here we're going to get the, the rationalization of this. The senators of Rome are this good belly, and you, the mutinous members. What do you think, you, the great toe of this assembly? And here he's, he's breaking out of this classical picture of the steed, the leg, and so forth, to pick a very inglorious member, the big toe. Uh, I, the great toe, why the great toe? For that being one of the lowest, basest, poorest of this most wise rebellion, thou goest foremost. You stick out in front, even though you're not a very noble member. Thou rascal, thou art worst in blood to run, leadest first to win some vantage. Um, so he tells the fable of the belly, and he's got them entertained. He's got them like a good politician in the palm of his hand. And now we have enter Caius Martius. Hail, noble Martius. Thanks. What's the matter, you dissentious rogues, that rubbing the poor itch of your opinion make yourselves scabs? So here we have body parts again, but they are body parts that have to do with disease and with injury, not with wholeness and not with the heroic structure. Uh, that the, the people are indeed part of the body politic, but exactly the kind that you hope will disappear, uh, rubbing the poor itch of your opinion. So it's all about affect and desire and symptomatization rather than about nobility and classical structure and so forth. And he won't stop talking this way. 
for a citizen. We have ever your good word. He that will give good words to thee will flatter beneath abhorring. What would you have, you curs? What are curs? Dogs. That, neither, that like no peace nor war. The one affrights you, the other makes you proud. He that trusts to you where he should find you lions finds you hares. Where fox is, geese. You are no surer no than is the coal of fire upon the ice or hailstone in the sun, and so forth. Who deserves greatness deserves your hate. And your affections are a sick man's appetite, who desires most that which would increase his evil. And he goes on at great length, particularizing the, the, the degree to which any noble person cannot depend upon them. He that depends upon your favors swims with fins of lead and hews down oaks with rushes, that is, with straws or, or, or uh, uh, bobtails, cat, cattails. What's the matter that in these several places of the city you cry against the noble senate? Uh, in this encounter with him, what do we learn about Martius as contrasted with Menenius and as contrasted with the common people? of the citizens and he lets them know that directly. Right, right. So here, just even here, before we get to his heroism, before we get to his refusing to expose himself to the people as a candidate, before, uh, before we get to his uh, unwillingness, which will, we, is crucial to uh, ask for their voices, ask for their votes, to pretend to be the, the, a good candidate here. And this is a play that's often read, incidentally, in the month of November, uh, together with the idea of, of, of American academic politics uh, or, or uh, national politics, too. Uh, in, in this case, uh, uh, what, do we, what, what kind of sense do we have about his capacity to use language? He's pretty articulate in all the wrong ways. Yeah. yeah. He, has no, he, has no, he doesn't seem to have any power to persuade uh, like the senators do. So how do you judge him at this point? Do you judge him as noble because he declines to make nice to the common people? I mean, pretty clearly Menenius has no higher opinion of these folks than Coriolanus, but he has a very different way of approaching him. Yes. He seems arrogant. 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 Uh, and so you judge him negatively. Yeah, but at the same time, I mean, there's a whole irony in, in the entire play. I mean, he is haughty toward them. Well, don't they deserve it? Yes, but he is haughty. <laughs> so should he lie to them and say, I mean, if, if he's haughty and they deserve it, what would be uh, better politics? What would be better, um, a, a better social model? Sometimes to be paradoxical. I mean, in the end, he sacrifices himself for them all. Uh, and how do you feel about that? I feel about. Uh, I you have to speak into the microphone. I'm taking these courses now, what, at least reading these plays. Right. I'm feeling could, could you speak into the microphone so we can hear I yourself? feel it's his destiny, in a way, to, uh, in the model of his heroism. Well, and that his uh, the kind of hero that he is goes through various uh, stages. So just let me get clear about what you mean by destiny. Do you mean something like that adage that we have cited from classical drama and talked about that character for mankind is fate, that his persona produces both his moments of achievement and his moments of self-destruction? What do you mean Almost by destiny? Almost like King Lear, in the sense that you know they do certain things, and they're seen. I see. A, I see. So, so you're, you're talking about the tragic model here, about yeah. the fall of a great man, right. because, because all the characters in the, in these plays uh, behave according to. I mean, I should put it the other way around. Our sense of them as characters uh, comes from what they say and what they do, and the relationship between those those two things. But in this case because he is the central figure in the play and because we track what happens to him, uh, it looks as if the, the, the entire structure of what happens is, is produced by his mm -hmm. view of himself, by his self-blindness, 
by the blind spots that also make it possible for him to be heroic. Mm -hmm. So, so my question then really had more to do with with whether. The, the image of heroism here, to come back to this, is also inevitably a, a, an image of, uh, of, of both self-blindness and of, of partial rather than wholeness. Do you have to be a wounded person in order to be a hero? Mm -hmm. no. I'm kind of puzzled by this because I, you know, I see everything he does as self-destructive. I mean, he destroys himself. Ultimately, his, act, his actions are going to be self-destructive of preserving harmony or order in Rome as a government official. Mm -hmm. um, at the end of the play, Ophidius you know, lists his flaws, pride, lack of judgment, singleness of nature. Uh, and then he says, uh, but he has merit to choke it in, in the utterance. In other words, his merit overwhelms all of these flaws. Right. But the, the utterance here being, his, being uh, Ophidius's utterance. Right. That, that, right. But I... I was always taught that uh, a heroic figure, especially a tragic heroic figure, has to have tragic recognition, has to understand himself finally in, in the end. And I'm wondering if this character really understands himself in the end, if he... Well, okay, let's, let's, let, let me again, let me try to reverse the telescope again here, because uh, the, leaving aside the little frame I was always taught, uh, these, these structures of this must do, this is the pattern. And so these, the, 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 the only law that makes this up is the concretion of our observation of individual histories. So uh, we could say that Macbeth does or does not get the point of what's happened to him, that Lear does or does not get the point of what's happened to him, that he, even at the end, he is thinking that Cordelia's alive, that the two of them can go off and sing like birds in a cage. There, there, there is a sense of the recognition, just to use Lear as my model here again, the recognition of poor bare forked animals, of the thing itself, and so forth. But whether there's a moment when uh, the Lear figure says, oh, I see, uh, that's uh, very often in these plays, it's a partial sight if it's that at all. Uh, you may feel that there's a moment in this play when Coriolanus could see himself and does not, uh, but maybe we should revise our paradigm, including this play, rather than to say this is a play which doesn't fit what we think or have thought up to this point is the tragic paradigm. That's actually the very strong uh, invitation that I came here this evening to, to offer to you, and that is the possibility of revising backward even our understanding of how these patterns might work by looking at what might seem to be something that is slightly eccentric to the pattern. Uh, please. Let me just restate it then. I sure. find this guy hard to like. Ah, many do, many do. But but, the, but that's that's that was really my point before as well. Uh, that the and that's that's the again. There have been people who have thought he was terrific, and people who have thought he was a spoiled brat, uh, you know, a, 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 a jerk, uh, a pampered mama's boy, whatever that is, a a uh, protected uh, patrician. Uh, somebody who came, became famous too early uh, and who didn't ever, you know, have to go up the hard way and so forth. Who knows what it is? But there are there are people. T. S. Eliot is one of them. But there are lots of critics for whom his nobleness precisely lies in his intolerance for what he thinks of as the mediocre. Uh, and that so that the the uh, there's not going to be one right answer here. This is again. This is more than almost any play we've looked at. To, up to this point, this is a play where opinions about the title character have varied enormously, and where how you re regard the title character, or you know where you're, you begin with in terms of politics, but let's say where, how you regard the, the title character is going to influence how you see not necessarily the successfulness of the play, but but what its what its implications are. Um, yes. 
right back, back there. I, I don't think that Coriolanus has ambition, political ambition, like Macbeth had. I think he's a simple soldier. He's good at what he does. He doesn't. He calls a spade a spade. I, in the beginning, I, we, we as we go along, we learn more about him, right. and we find out more about him. But at the beginning, he's nothing. There's nothing wrong with him. There's nothing negative about him. He just is. He doesn't play games. He doesn't try and win over the crowds like Meninius does. He doesn't con them along like he does. Right. He just straightforward soldier. That's what he does. That's what he's good at. Well, I agree with like 99% of that, but I wouldn't call him simple. And I really wouldn't call him straightforward. He's a very complicated psychological figure. I think, and his, but his ideals, such as they are, have to do with heroism in warfare, with um, being the single one, alone I did it. He rushes into the city of Coriolis before anybody else. He, that we'll look in a second at Comenius's speech beginning, I shall lack voice, the deeds of Coriolanus should not be uttered feebly. What kind of wonderful use of that topos of, of inexpressibility that then goes on uh, for wonderful lines. And I do want to look at that to talk about what's great about Coriolanus. But, but, but the, the, to say that he's simple, I mean, first of all, nobody in Shakespeare who ever says he is himself simple is simple, or Richard III or Henry V or whatever it is. But in this case, his, his relationship, certainly to Volumnia, also to both of the male, or all three maybe, of the male models that he's dealing with, Cominius, Ophidius, and Meninius, is very complicated. Uh, his relationship to his wife and his son is complicated. These are not simple relations, I think. But there, there's something uncompromising about him. There's, there's something about him that will not make a deal and or doesn't want to make a deal, whether the deal is running for office and showing his wounds and so forth. There's this business of not being willing to show the wounds that, again, has stirred so much interest in very recent critics in this question of his body and whether the body speaks and whether there is something uh, that... I, uh, some, something that renders his body not, neither male nor female in its self-exposure or in its refusal to, to, to self-expose. Uh, uh, and also the reconciliation scene with the mother, in which he, he remember, the, he wants to, to uh, think of himself as an author of himself who has no other kin. He divorces his mother, so to speak. Um, he divorces his wife and his child, hypothetically, because these are painful encroachments upon him and because somehow the human feelings that he has toward them uh, keep him from having that... Uh, uh, frozenness of demeanor, that self-protectiveness of not feeling, that is the carapace into which he begins to, to pull himself after these moments of injury. So that the, the, the paradox about him has to do with the fact that his moments of human feeling, so to speak, and his moments of relationship are also those moments that ultimately bring him to his doom. Uh, so it's a, a, you could say it's another kind of retelling of this fable of the belly in which his connectedness to the sociolect, to the, to the world of people, to the, to the nuclear family as we would call it and they would not, but to the, to the mother, to the wife, to the son, uh, to the, the, the old father of Meninius who is the, the stand-in for the father here, that his rejection of all of those things is so aggressively self-protective. Um, and because he feels that to be a man, he can, he must not feel. And, or at least he must not feel in the domestic. He must not feel in the social. Where he can feel is in the martial. And that's where the complicatedness of his relationship to Ophidius and to Comenius comes in as well. Yeah, please, you have, you have a right to rebuttal, absolutely. <laughs> Just very briefly. Please. I think that's what I mean by simple. Yes. That his personality stays the same Everything else weaves around him. Well, see, this comes back to the question that we had up over here earlier, which I think is a really important one, as to whether he, uh, whether or not he has a moment of recognition. Uh, he has several moments in which he seems to recognize something. Whether what he recognizes is himself is maybe another question. But whether there is a change in him or whether, he, whether the world changes around him and he remains stable, that's a very good question, I think, for us. Uh, who feels that there, that, that there are... Uh, yes. I think he, he's a, 
almost, he's an anti-politician in a, in, the, in a very political play. Uh, in other words, right. everybody else in the play is concerned with some aspect of political life. Right. Uh, and uh, they're also, everybody else in the play is concerned with, uh, it constantly talks about their opinion of him. Right. And in fact, most of them seem to be able to find in his virtue, even in his virtues, flaws. Uh, I mean, the very first citizens talk about, talk about, well, really, he's, he's only joining this army uh, in order to, you know, if, if it succeeds, uh, he'll take all of Caminas' glory. If it doesn't succeed, he can blame it on Caminas. Uh, when in fact, he, uh, he doesn't want any credit for the victory when it occurs. And I think he does have one moment of self, he has a moment of self-realization. When he breaks his bonds, so to speak, in the, and gives in to Volumnia, he recognizes that it is a mortal yes. choice. Yes, right, right. Most mortal to him. I mean, that, that, that's, that's, that's maybe the moment that one would look at in which he says, this is a choice, this is a decision. Most, that, that, that he's talking about the, the mother having prevailed and that this is most mortal to him, which means has the usual double meaning of about to cause his death and making him alive. And this, the, the, the moment of his mortality is the moment of his non-immortality, yeah, but also the moment of his, his being able to feel. And so this, the, I, the, the, here we would find, I think, a consistency with, with the pattern of Lear and the pattern of Macbeth in that the moment of concession uh, and uh, self-abandonment here uh, is also the moment of re-self-claiming, that, that, that he has to lose himself to find himself. That there's a, we'll take one more question, and then I think we'll probably have to take a break. Yes, I'm sorry, you've been trying to speak for some time. Past that point now. Um, I just wanted to mention one of the scenes that I found sort of endearing um, about, uh, is when he's in disguise at the house of Orphidius yes. Yes. and um, and, it, and he's incorrigible. I mean, he treats the, uh, he's there, he is in rags and he's indubitably himself. Right. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. No, I, I, it's, it's a wonderful scene on stage yes. as well. It's a great scene. I quite agree. I, I think we are constrained by our tape and our time to take a five minute break. Uh, we'll regroup uh, in maybe seven minutes. Ah, and a question right away. Okay, I, I, I promised that we would start uh, by talking about the question of whether, uh, in the play at least, deeds of war inevitably dehumanize. Whether, because this, this speaks to this same question that we uh, were talking about a few minutes ago, the question of whether he's better than or worse than regular people, so to speak. Um, and the, the speech that led to this, this question, and a speech that I promised you that we'd look at anyhow, is Comenius's speech, I shall lack voice, in Act 2, Scene 2. I promise that we'll get to the next question as soon as we, we looked at this. Um, so it's Act 2, Scene 2. This is the praise, of course, by the eloquent Comenius of the less eloquent. Coriolanus. The citizens speak. Yes, indeed. We're, we're, no, hi. Okay. You haven't missed anything. We're, 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 we're trying to, to enter into the question of whether uh, an argument within the play is that heroism in war is inherently or uh, consistently or persistently a dehumanizing activity. Uh, it's a good question for the contemporary world. So we're, we're looking, I'm just going to read you briefly, or not so briefly since it's long, uh, this wonderful speech by Cominius beginning, I shall lack voice, the speech that I mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, the uh, invitation comes from Meninius that Cominius, the general, will proceed and speak the praise of Coriolanus, who has left the, 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 the stage, bear in mind. Uh, 
I had rather have one. I would ra rather have one scratch my head in the sun when the alarms were struck than idly sit to hear my nothings monstered. So again, I, I I would be treated like a toy or a dog or a, some other kind of, of of figure rather than a soldier if I were to stay here and listen to the monstering that is. Uh, from the word monstro, meaning to show or to demonstrate, but also making myself into a monster, my nothings monstered, my achievements uh, blown up into a kind of a caricature. So he leaves, uh, and uh, we have the speech of Cominius. I shall lack voice. The deeds of Coriolanus should not be uttered feebly. This is, as I say, that, that inexpressibility topos. I can't possibly give you his praise, which I'm about to give you. Um, it is held that valor is the chiefest virtue and most dignifies the haver. If it be, the man I speak of cannot in the world be singly counterpoised. Nobody matches him. At 16 years, when Tarquin made a head for Rome, he fought beyond the mark of others. Our then dictator, whom with all praise I point out, saw him fight, when with his Amazonian chin, he drove the bristled lips before him. What is an Amazonian chin here? Young boy doesn't, doesn't, have, doesn't shave yet. He drove the bristled lips before him. So he's, he's young, the other soldiers are older, are men. He's a boy. So there's that hidden boy again to which we're going to be returning. Uh, he bestrid an oppressed Roman and in the consul's views threw three, slew three opposers. Tarquin self he met and struck him on his knee. And say, made him kneel. In that day's feats, when he might act the woman in the scene, he proved the best man in the field, and for his mead was brow bound with the oak. What does it mean he, when he might act the woman in the scene? Could have been a boy actor, been a boy actor uh, but he also could have behaved not like a man, but like uh, a, a non man. Here, I mean, as, as with Macbeth, the opposite of man could be woman, could be weeping person, could be boy, could be child. Uh, we might act the woman in the scene. He proved best man in the field, and for his mead was brow bound with the oak, that is the garland, of course, of heroism. His pupil age, man entered thus, so he's a student, but he be, he's already become a man. Uh, he never was a pupil, really. He, he waxed like a sea, so here we have already his, his transformation into a natural force. And in the brunt of 17 battles since, he lurched all swords of the garland. That is to say, he won every possible award. For this last, before an incorriles, let me say I cannot speak him home. There's that inexpressibility again. I can't say enough. I can't home meaning, you know, perfectly. I can't. I can't I, my words are, are, are inadequate. He stopped the flyers and by his rare example made the coward turn terror into sport. As weeds before a vessel under sail, so men obeyed and fell below his stem. His sword, death's stamp, where it did mark, it took. From face to foot, he was a thing of blood whose every motion was timed with dying cries. Alone he entered the mortal city gate of the city, which he painted with shunless destiny. Aidless came off, and with a sudden reinforcement struck Coriolis like a planet. Uh, what is the mortal gate of the city here? Yes. Yeah. The, the, the dangerous, the, the, the uh, p potentially deathly to him. But this, the mortality, this theme of mortality as the, speaks against this question of the thing. Uh, so that the mortality here is located in the space, or mortal, the word mortal is located in the space of death rather than the space of, of the humane here, the mortal gate of the city. Uh, but a gate is also a breach. And this speaks again to this question of the openness of the body and its, therefore, vulnerability. But in this case, it's the city that is open. It is he who, who uh, penetrates the city. Who, and, and he has become a thing. His every every uh, stroke motion is, was timed with dying cries. Who, whose are the cries? Who's dying? Sorry? The, yes, the, 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 the enemy, so-called, the people whom he's, he's, he's uh, killing here. So, so th this is the speech in which he gets transformed rhetorically from boy to man to thing of blood.
and we may see this as a kind of apocalyptic image, if we like, that he emerges as a thing of blood, as a kind of, of, of uh, uh, avenging figure of revelation. Uh, but in any case, what we also have here is the refusal of childhood, the refusal of woman, uh, the transcendence of man, and the becoming instead of a thing. Now, this is meant as praise. This is meant to be the, the kickoff of the Coriolanus campaign, uh, that now he's going to get his surname, his addition, Coriolanus, uh, and he's going to enter from the, and this is, again, not, not unknown to our modern era, going to enter from the martial into the political. But he's, the, 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 the description of him runs exactly counter to that. Yes. I'm just struck by this description of uh, him in battle. I was thinking of Macbeth and the description we get of Macbeth at the beginning of the play, uh, where he unseamed him from the nave to the chops. Right. Uh, um, this uh, from face to foot, he was a thing of blood. Right. And then, of course, he does get this this title after this glorious right. combat, as Macbeth does as well. Right. Uh, but to push that a little further, it seems to me that uh, Coriolanus refuses uh, ambition. Uh, and Macbeth embraces it. Maybe a contrast. Well, again, I, you know, it depends upon what we mean by ambition. I wouldn't say that he is unambitious, but he's ambitious for undying, which might also mean unliving, fame. Not for money, not for power, not for... I mean, if we want to restrict the notion of ambition to the idea of civic or kingly power, and then we say, well, Macbeth is ambitious. Uh, but I don't think that the, this is an unambitious figure. It's just that he's ambitious to become uh, something quite different from uh, a, a, a political figure. Uh, but I don't think that he's without, I mean, there, there, is, a, there is a becoming modesty to him. And the, his, his ambition and his modesty are, are, are versions of the same. So I think, I, I mean, I, I, it's not that I disagree with you, really, but I think that it's not that he doesn't want something. It's just that what he wants is not something he wants to depend upon people to get. Yes. Well, I was thinking about Valunia, and do you think that it's only she who could have reached um, through, finally, to her son? Because it was she, a powerless creature, who created this hero warrior uh, and made him so successful. Why do you say she's as powerless? A, well, I think as a woman, she had little uh, but, power. So, but that's, 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 that's what you think over here. Where do you find it in the play? Mm. Where do you find it in the play? I don't really. This, well, it was, it's the same question about the course of heroism, about ambition, and so forth. That that our invitation. Her name is Volumnia. Her name isn't uh, Minima. Uh, <laughs> Did you know that that women in Rome at that time, at least, were behind the scenes? Well, uh, you know, uh, Agrippina. The, I mean, there there are power. There, there, I mean, historically, there are powerful women in Rome, but but this is not Rome. It's not isn't even England. It's it's just a play. But the references to Rome are are certainly present. Well, it it just seemed to me that she she helped create this great hero warrior. After all, that's quite and, right. and crippled him to some extent because she didn't create a fully human person. He was never able to move between. He was intractable because he couldn't. He didn't have the ability to move um, away from all he, all he knew. Well, and it was only she in the end who maybe could reach him. I, I think this is absolutely the case, that, that, uh, that she has created him. But I think that we should look at the passage in which, and I'm, I'm trying to quickly find it here, uh, the, this, the, the, that much commented upon passage uh, in which the idea is that she, uh, the, the bre breasts of, 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 of Hecuba that uh, suckled, suckled Hector uh, look not more beautiful than uh, her, his spitting blood, you know, that the, the idea is that she refuses milk and that she wants from him blood instead, that, this, that she creates him. Uh, in a model that is very, very much... Can somebody find this passage for me really quickly while I'm uh, hunting about... I should have it written down, I'm sorry to say. I don't. Um, 
Well, let's look at another, another alumni moment while I look for this, and that's the moment uh, when, having created him in this martial image, uh, she then, in his view, betrays the model that he, th you know, he thinks he's done it just right. And then she says to him, well, come on, what's a little pretense, what's a little lie, what's a little acting, after all? And for him, this is a matter of tremendous uh, uh, psychological reversal. Uh, this is, and, and, and here we are in uh, Act uh, 3, Scene 2. About, about page, uh, about, about line uh, 70. Actually, let's let go, if you go back with me as far as uh, line 46, this is the, the uh, where she's, she's changing the rules, basically. She now is suggesting to him that having done this other thing, uh, it's time to to become ambitious in the worldly sense. Uh, if it be honor in your wars to seem the same you are not, how is it less or worse that it shall hold companionship in peace with honor as in war? Since that to both, it stands in like request. So you pretend certain kinds of things in war. Why not do it here in peace? Um, and now moving over to about line 73, I prithee now, my son, go to them with this bonnet in thy hand, and thus far having stretched it, here be with them, thy knee bussing the stones, kneel, remember the passage we just looked at, uh, he made Tarquin kneel, for in such business action is eloquence, and the eyes of the ignorant more learned than the ears, here we're obviously speaking in a coded way about actors on the stage and groundlings in the audience, as well as about, about what actions might have meant in ancient Rome. Waving thy head, which oft thus, correcting thy stout heart, now humble as the ripest mulberry that will not hold the handling, say to them, thou art their soldier. Being bred in broils, that is, battles, has not the soft way which thou dost confess were fit for thee to use. Remember, who else had, had exactly said that? Didn't have the soft way of speaking because he was a soldier. It's Othello. Yes, exactly. But thou wilt frame thyself, forsooth, hereafter theirs, so far as thou hast power and person. Uh, so she devises for him an acting scheme, a scheme of performance, of dissimulation, action is eloquence, and he really is disconcerted by this. Come, come, we'll prompt you, says Cominius, Bolomnia. I prithee now, sweet son, as thou hast said my praises made thee first a soldier, so to have my praise for this, it's never going to be enough, it's never going to be enough, perform a part thou hast not done before. And so this, this, this escalating language of the theater, perform a part, we'll prompt you, uh, action is eloquence, and so forth, is bringing to the surface of this language of the theater here changes the rules. Uh, but also we see it in present time, not as recounted by somebody else. We see the present moment. Well, I must do it. Away my disposition and possess me some harlot's Spirit. Now, the harlot here is not a, a, uh, a prostitute, but a, a vagabond of a certain kind. Uh, my throat of war be tuned, returned, which quired with my drum into a pipe, small as and eunuch. Now, if you know the early plays of Shakespeare, you could go all the way back to Richard III's opening soliloquy uh, in, in that play, in which he talks about how the, the, uh, the, 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 the martial uh, marches, again, are now turned into to dancing measures, and the pipe and the lute have replaced somehow the, the language, the drama, and the war. Small as a eunuch, what's a eunuch again? An emasculated, uh, a, a male who's been castrated and whose voice, in the case of the castrato, especially an emasculated young, whose voice has not changed into a pipe. Sorry? Isn't it also a kind of musical instrument? That's what my is a eunuch is. A, a musical instrument? According to the note in this edition, it says it's a small flute-shaped musical instrument. 
My goodness, okay. The picture, but, you know, I don't know, I'm just reading it. Okay, I just not, doesn't say that in my note. Uh, the other scholars have a view about this? I've never heard of that. And then we'll have to look it up. Wow. We'll have to look it up and see whether that's the case. Um, the, the, the piping voice here, now again, remember, uh, we're, we have a male actor playing Coriolanus, talking to a male actor, boy actor, playing Volumnia, talking about the transformation of the male voice into a piping voice, which hasn't changed yet, like the voice of a eunuch, or the virgin voice that babies lull asleep. That in a sense means that, that lull babies asleep. That, that, so the, 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 uh, these are, this is the voice of a eunuch or a woman here. The smiles of knaves taint in my cheeks and schoolboy's tears, here they are again, here are those tears. Schoolboy's tears take up the glasses of my sight. A beggar's tongue make motion through my lips and my armed knees, which bowed but in my stirrup. The only time I bent my knees was when I was riding a horse. Bend like his that hath received it alms. I'm becoming a beggar here again. I will not do it lest I surcease to honor mine own truth, and by my body's action teeth by mind a most inherent baseness. At thy choice, then, to beg of thee it is my more dishonor than thou of then. Come all to ruin, let thy mother rather feel thy pride, I mean, this is so, such a contemporary notion, than fear thy dangerous stoutness, for I mock at death with as big a heart as thou. Do as thou list. I mean, you can see this in the novels of Philip Roth. Uh, thy valiantness was mine, thou suckedest from me, but oh, thy pride thyself. So again, she's taken all the manhood is herself. I was the valiant one, you got it from my nursing breast. But oh, that is own thy pride thyself. Pray be content. Mother, I am going to the marketplace. <laughs> Chide me no more. I'll mount a bank their loves. What's a mount a bank? It's a charlatan, it's especially kind of a, a, a snake oil salesman. It's a, kind of, it's a charlatan who, who, who is in business to make money from false products and things like that. Uh, the, I'll, I'll, I'll mount a bank their loves, cog their hearts from them, and come home beloved of all the trades in Rome. Now, what does that mean? What does trades mean here? The workers, yes, exactly. All those common, those artisans, the, the shoemaker and the cobbler and all those people who show up at the beginning of, of scenes in Romeo and Juliet or here or in, in, in Julius Caesar. Uh, I'm going to prostitute myself in front of these unworthy people for you. Uh, look, I am going. Commend me to my wife. I'll return consul or never trust what my tongue can do in the way of flattery further. Uh, so, uh, still coached by them, mildly, mildly, and so forth, he goes off to uh, violate everything that he thinks he was taught. Um, so that the, the, we've talked here about the trajectory of desire and how you never achieve your desire. In this case, what he never achieves is pleasing his mother. He never finally met the, the image that he has created of himself uh, in order to be the person that she wants him to be or to be the thing that she wants him to be. Uh, never ultimately matches up with that, with, with, with her. Uh, that that this, this is deferred and deferred and deferred and deferred until that scene that we talked about before. And I'd like to move to that, that, that other Volumnia scene now while we're still thinking about her, the scene in Act 5, scene, scene 3, when you may remember he has, uh, he has fled Rome in order to uh, flee uh, these human connections that he wants to be a, a, a lonely dragon in his fan, author himself as if, a, a, and had no other kin, uh, that Rome and mother, which are the same thing for him, are that which he feels he must banish because he feels banished by them. And he goes over to the side of the enemy and begins to fight against them. And the only weapons that they have to recuperate him are the, is this same structure of the old father Meninius, 
the mother and child, both of whom come as embassies to him, and he says no. Uh, Comenius, you know, he was a kind of nothing, titleless. Uh, again, he's, he, he doesn't want any names. He wants to be a nothing. His nothingness is more powerful than any humanness would be until the mother, the third member of this embassy, comes to see him. And this is in Act 5, Scene 3. Um, the, uh, about line 130, where he is about to leave the mother and the, the, the mother, wife, and children who have come to him in a cl cluster here. Um, not of a woman's tenderness to be requires, nor a child, nor a woman's face to see. I have sat too long. And he rises. Nay, go not from us thus. And then she goes on in this long speech, which I won't read all of this, to talk, uh, to, to, to talk about what happens if you reverse the picture. Uh, his repetition will be dogged with curses. The name you will reap, and she uses that word, name, whose repetition will be dogged with curses. And this, that's why I wanted you to notice the word cur before, that now he's the dog. Uh, whose chronicle, thus writ, and here's, this is, if he's got an ambition, it's for this, it's for history. His chronicle, thus writ, the man was noble, but with his last attempt, he wiped it out, destroyed his country, and his name remains to the ensuing age abhorred. Speak to me, son. Thou hast affected the fine strains of honor, to imitate the graces of the gods, to tear with thunder the wide cheeks of the air. Why dost not speak? Think'st thou it honorable for a noble man still to remember wrongs? Daughter, speak you. He cares not for your weeping. Speak thou, boy. There's no man in the world more bound to his mother, yet here he lets me prate like one in the stocks. Again, remember, with Kent, this is a punishment for, for ignoble people. Thou hast never in thy life showed thy dear mother any courtesy, when she, poor hen, fond of no second brood, has clocked thee to the wars and safely home, loaden with honor. Say my requests unjust and spurn me back. But if it be not so, thou art not honest, and the gods will plague thee that thou restrainst from me the duty which to a mother's part belongs. He turns away. So she's describing the stage action. Down, ladies, let us shame him with our knees. To his surname, Coriolanus, longs more pride, that is, belongs more pride, than pity to our prayers. Down and end. This is the last. So we will home to Rome, the rhyme is deliberate here, and die among our neighbors. Nay, behold us, this boy that cannot tell what he would have but kneels and holds up hands for fellowship. Come, let us go. This fellow had a vulsion to his mother. His wife is in Coriolis and his child like him by chance. Yet give us our dispatch, send us away. I am hushed until our city be afire, and then I'll speak a little. And here the famous stage direction holds her by the hand, silent. Oh, mother, mother, what have you done? Behold, the heavens do ope, the gods look down, and this unnatural scene they laugh at. What's unnatural about it? She's kneeling. She's kneeling to him. You have, oh, my mother, mother, oh, you have won a happy victory to Rome, but for your son, believe it, oh, believe it, most dangerously you have with him prevailed, if not most mortal to him. Uh, what, but happy victory to Rome. What does happy mean here? Lucky. Fortunate, exactly. Where, where, do you remember where we saw that word again describing a victory to Rome uh, in the last play that we looked at? It was in Octavius's final speech when he's talking about the happy, again, happy victory versus the mortal glory of the dead Antony and Cleopatra here, that this notion of a happy victory and the mortal loss is here repeated uh, by Coriolanus here. Uh, happy victory, not most mortal to him. And you may remember that there's a moment in this play when Ophidius says, 
to himself. In fact, he says it on the next page here. I am glad thou hast set thy mercy and thy honor at difference in thee. He says this aside, this is a crucial moment. Out of that, I'll work myself a former fortune. This is that same split, mercy and honor. The public and the private, the inside and the outside, the family and not even the state, because the state here becomes part of the family. It's the story of Rome as home and of, the, of Volumnia as the figure of Rome, as Volumnia here surely reminding people of that, that the, 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 the wolf that suckled Romulus and Remus, who was the figure of Rome. But here it's, it's history, it's chronicle, it's fame. Uh, which is the other to the merciful and the mortal. And yes, please. Uh, it doesn't make the statement by Alpidius, however, uh, basically uh, uh, state his position, and that is that he recognizes that by being the leader, leader of the Volscians, uh, that uh, uh, Coriolanus has actually outshone him there's several remarks all the way along, mm -hmm. and he suddenly realizes that if he takes, if he actually conquers Rome, uh, he will uh, he will place himself in a, a secondary position, and that by entering this, resolving the issue, uh, he actually gives an opening for Alphidius to uh, take control again. I'm sorry, it's Coriolanus who, I, 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 By, by right. Coriolanus uh, settling the war rather right. than conquering Rome. Yes, yes, Rome. exactly. He has given Ophidius Absolutely. The, Absolutely. The, right. the opening to right. take control again. Right, so the, the mercifulness here, the non-war likeness, the, the, the reversal of the previous position uh, is the one that will allow Ophidius to recapture the top, at least among the Volscians. Uh, no, that's, 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 that is what he's saying, precisely. But, but I, what I wanted also to underscore was the idea that mercy and honor are, in uh, Ophidius's view, at odds with one another. The fact that he speaks this as an aside here uh, is an indication, as with Edgar speaking to us in an aside in King Lear, as with Iago speaking to us in asides in, in Othello, that we may take this to be a kind of truth. That is, this is a kind of reading of the scene that's, that's going on. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm going to sneak in a couple of quick ones. Um, um, I, I'm probably being dumb about this, but I'm wondering what it is that Co uh, Coriolanus is afraid of when he, he says, um, most dangerously you have with him prevailed, because yes. he does... Um, he does come in with the citizens and says, uh, in a very sort of, you know, positive way, I, right. I'm returned your soldier. And then just quickly, um, um, Volumina, um, uh, from the play, from the text, um, how do, how are we to think that she feels about Coriolanus's death? How do you, because at the beginning of the play, remember, if he dies with honor, she tells Virgilio, that's just fine by her. That's so, right. And I wondered if she would regard his death as a death, as an honorable death, and therefore uh, go home singing. <laughs> what evidence do we have in the play other than the evidence that you yourself cited? And, that, and her silence, that, 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 that Shakespeare, I've learned that, that Shakespeare, if Shakespeare wants us to know something, he'll tell us, and, he, and Volumina doesn't say anything after that last speech. She, that's, that's it for her. Well, this, this extraordinarily powerful gesture of reaching across the abyss <clears throat> that we see in almost all of these tragedies, we see it with, with uh, Antony and Cleopatra dying in separate places and reaching for, I am dying, Egypt dying. Uh, we see uh, in, uh, the, uh, this the, Lear twice, the, the uh, you do me wrong to take me out of the grave, and again, this feather stirs, she lives. This attempt to reach across the abyss here, uh, those are death and life abysses, and so is the, the, the moment at the end of Hamlet. But, but here, too, there's an attempt to make a human connection as against the political, the mortal, whatever. And the, the extraordinary power of that moment is that he does understand it. He does understand the complicatedness of what he is yielding up by reaching 
across to her. Now, whether she's satisfied or not, uh, I think with you that this is, this is left as a matter of theatrical interpretation because we, we can only extrapolate from what she has said and what she has not said. Uh, and there would be more than one way of playing. I mean, I read the scene rather broadly here, just in order to underscore certain moments that, 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 that are full of irony. But there would be ways of doing it that would be more tender and less ironic than, than what I did, presumably. Uh, yes? But, but she knows how to push his buttons. She, she knows where they are, and she works against him. She's like the stereotypical mother, my son, the doctor. Um, it's her pride that she's augmenting by his successes. Right. She's the one who's ambitious. Right. And so she works him for her goal, for her ends. And I think at the end, when she is silent, it's because there is no more. But she has, she has achieved her aim of saving Rome, which was her latest plan. <laughs> and then there, that's all that she cares about. Okay. Yes. Hasn't, she, hasn't she also got what she wants because uh, we're led to believe at the end of the play, his memory, yet he shall have a noble memory. A noble memory. Right. A noble memory. So, so maybe she's got what she wants in that regard. But I, I, in this moment when uh, uh, Coriolanus uh, surrenders to her, yeah. um, it seems to me that's, he, that's inevitable. That's, in other words, that's what he's always done. Well, that, that, that's why I wanted to read those two scenes with you together. Mm -hmm. That in the, the, the case of his making himself a candidate, and remember this comes out of the candid or white garment that you wear, uh, that you were, did wear in ancient Rome in order to announce your candidacy. That it's, that, again, the, the idea that a candidate is candid, uh, that is white and uh, wearing white and uh, pure, uh, is uh, may have a certain irony today, but 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 the idea is precisely that the 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 eloquent action is of openness and of see these are the wounds I got for you and and I, my wounds speak to you and so forth that the, that, that this this desire to uh, uh, to expose him is just exactly what he doesn't want now whether she's gotten what she wants or whether. Uh, there is no getting what she wants, is another question. Yes, okay. The, um, the um, motif of monster uh, plays yes. a lot to that, uh, the yeah. same way it does in Othello, um, yep. with like him saying, oh, monstrous, monstrous, and, right. and so on. Um, and it's, it's even more, it's much more prevalent in Othello, but um, the idea of um, he's he's got this sort of like uh, overcompensation for, for a, um, this kind of, uh, almost kind of a, a grief he, he doesn't want to have. Uh, exposed um, a, a lot, a lot in the same way that the fellow does. Um, he he compensates for it. He seems he's he's a lot like um, Achilles in that way. That he's kind of this man of sorrow that is like this. Everything is like a monomania for for uh, achieving and making a name for himself. Well, the Achilles, no, the, you mean Shakespeare's Achilles? Um, well, I was thinking of Homer's, but uh, yeah. <laughs> I see. Let's think about Shakespeare's, uh, because it's, I mean, it's an interesting comparison, since, since in both cases, these are singular warriors who, um, uh, at a given moment, decline to fight. You could say that what Achilles does after he is enraged by the death of Patroclus is very much like this description that we get about Coriolanus going amok here, except that it is less honorable, except that we have the, the Myrmidons uh, pulling Hector through, that, that, that he refuses the single fight. Uh, there's never a moment in Coriolanus in which you see him uh, uh, betray his notions about battlefield decorum, per se. Um, but the, the idea that he, by obeying his mother, is betraying what she taught him, uh, you can see the double bind involved in that. And the, and the question really is, in part, whether it's that double bind, so to speak, that makes the hero. That, that the, the, the inability to have it either way, the necessity to have it both ways, the impossibility of the position that he occupies, is not so different from that paradoxical notion about being your own parent, about being author of yourself and having no other kin. That's the monstrous position, the dragon in his lair and so forth. And, and the, it's, it, it is, it's portrayed in the play repeatedly as 
monstrous. In the same way that this cartoon belly speaking is monstrous too. Uh, but, but the alternative to the monstrosity seems to be the human. And, and that, that, that is something that this play has in common with some of the other plays that we've looked at recently. And it's hard to know which, which one to choose here. Yes, another question, sorry. No, I was just thinking about that image of the lonely dragon in yes. the fen, which I just love. I think uh -huh. that that sums up his um, character to me so much, that he is a dragon, he's a machine, he's a monster, he's warlike, um, breathing fire, but he's also very lonely. Right, right. Um, and I, I, that, the word lonely is a very interesting word here because it probably means more than he means to say. I mean, because it, 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 it could mean singular or alone or alone or something, but it does carry for us also that pathos of loneliness that I think is probably not, I mean, so far as we can talk about a fictional character's intention, that that's probably not part of his discourse. That notion of pathos, of feel sorry for me, is not so much part of his, his, his own vocabulary, but it speaks through him to us. Many hands. Many hands. Oh, just a quick one. I think it's interesting that Shakespeare denies Coriolanus a heroic death. I mean, it's a, it's a horrible death. It's a really savage death. When right. the, uh, and the, um, similarly in Troilus and Cressida, Hector is denied the hero's death. Yes. He's, he's, um, um, Achilles strikes him when, when Hector is unarmed. Right. Yeah. right. Right, and then of course he's dragged around the field. Uh, but but the, the de I did want to say something about the death of Coriolanus because how does he die? What happens to him? Um, the uh, the uh, the conspirators with, uh, fall upon him in a, right. in a great group and uh, stab him. I would imagine. Right, right. Uh, so that there's the, again there's this sense of of the one and the many. There's the sense. Almost, you know, at the end of, of a Greek tragedy, to go back to this moment that we discussed earlier on, whether there's a homology between ancient Greek tragedy and these, there, there's, there's often what's called the sparagmos, the tearing apart of the hero, the, 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 the turning into fragments of the body. And if that's what's going on here, then it returns us to that fable of the belly again, in which all the parts are out there. Only in this case, he is the sacrificial image of that. He, he, is, it's like he is the literal scapegoat, not the literal, but he's the functional scapegoat in that what happens to him enables their reunification someplace else. And instead of the, the body politic being pulled in various pieces, he himself is cut in pieces. And that, that the that nobility that he achieves in death is paradoxically also the salvific moment that he couldn't achieve as a, as a, as a living figure. So that the, the 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 aloneness functions here as well. Like the behind the, yeah. when you speak, <clears throat> excuse me, of the aloneness, it's his relationship with Ophidius is one yes. that had an intimacy That's that right. you, you never see in any of the other figures. Right. Right. Uh, and maybe we should look at those passages too, because the the, the uh, there's the, the, this famous moment in which he says, you know, I, I, I find my arms around this body that I injured and so forth, where it's very much uh, what literary critics would call a homosocial moment, that is a moment of male bonding, of male-male identification in which he feels, again, safe in the world of men, not safe in the world of women, mother, child, the sister, Lady Valeria, and so forth. Uh, the child, of course, is a boy, but a boy, as we've seen, is either going to become a man and a monster, tearing that butterfly to pieces, or else he's going to remain in the cluster with the ladies. Uh, uh, but, but it's precisely with Ophidius that he finds his perfect partner, and then that relationship itself is betrayed when it becomes competitive once again. Because Ophidius is quite glad to have him uh, when he, he first arrives and seems to be a petitioner, seems to be somebody who has nothing. But very quick. And then, then, then of course, in, in this, the ending scene, which I, we really must look at, uh, it's Ophidius who reminds him of that very same thing that in the long passage from Volumnia that I read to you, she is pointing out to him over and over again, that she says to him, well, you can't have a surname based upon defeating Rome. 
you can't be the Roman who kills Rome. And then Aphidius will turn the, the tables on him and say, you know, what do you mean? How, what do you want us to call you, Coriolanus? You, you, you destroyed our city. Uh, this is not a compliment to us. Uh, and again, this, this never quite occurred to him that this is inappropriate in this other place. But the, the, the mother has already set up this template here. Uh, how do you see, the, how would you compare um, Ophidius and Comenius, say, with whom he also has this moment of male bonding, is also this moment of twinning between them right after the first, the, the victory over Coriolis. Yes? Well, I, I would think that the warrior could, I think you said this or someplace I read this, the warrior only knows who he is by comparing himself with someone else. Um, but also, in those two saw each other as lions. What greater love can two heroes have than for somebody of comparable? Well, but uh, two, we turns out, is never a functional number in this play. That that uh, as as we saw slightly differently in Aunt Nan Cleopatra, that three wasn't possible and two wasn't possible, and ultimately, you know, even for our Aunt Nan Cleopatra themselves, two had to become one. So here also, the very fact of the twinning between them means that one will need to prevail. And you'll remember that moment when Aphidius says, "I'll I'll I'll." Uh, I'll potch at him some way, or guile or craft will get him. The moment when he says, well, I can't defeat him in that uh, battlefield way. So I'm going to find another way. I'm going to find a, uh, like Iago saying, we work by wit and not by witchcraft. And I'm going to find a, and, and again, just about every uh, Shakespearean antagonist will make a claim like that. Richard III will make a similar claim. That the, the, the idea that if you can't win by mar martial fo fo force on the battlefield, you can win by another way. Ulysses in Troilus and Cressida, much the same kind of argument. Indeed, you could see Menenius as a kind of figure like Ulysses in Coriolanus, I think. Again, an, an older figure. Uh, coming back to a politics rather than to a martial world. Do you have a, a question over there? You, okay, right here, please, yes. Yeah, just a quick question. Yes. Um, it comes up in the play all the time, and you've used it a number of times. Now, what, the nobility, Yes. The, um, how do you define it in this context? I mean, it, um, well, that, noble and nobility, I mean, it comes up in the play all the time. That, again, that, that, this is one of the, I mean, this is a very deeply ironic or multivalent play, a play that is hard to pin down, that they, they, he shall have a noble corpse. This idea that, I mean, what's noble about a corpse? Is, I mean, is it that that's the, the only place where, 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 where nobility can be? Uh, or is it the impossibility of, uh, I mean, the, the, this, precisely this term is up for grabs in the play. I think, and uh, the the man who prefers a noble life before a long, for example, this this that, that question that is posed to the the uh, citizens at the beginning. They come with me if you believe, prefer a, a noble life before a long. That, that if you're willing to fight, if you're willing to behave nobly, it might mean dying. So, is nobility, in fact, in this this play, uh, equivalent to uh, the other kind of mortality, the dying rather than the living? But what do you think? I, I don't know. I mean, because it is used in all these contexts. I mean, it's yeah. in, I mean, in the, you mentioned it earlier with the, with the mother yes. talking about it and, and with the noble corpse. And, and uh, in the beginning, uh, Ophidia issues it, I think, at the end, he talks about nobility of Coriolanus. Uh, so, I mean, you know, that's why I asked, yeah. because, I mean, it's, it's so, it's almost misused because it's used so often. Well, I think I, as this why, it's why I'm saying it slightly differently to say that it. it well, but I'm you're as right as I am that that, that, it, that the term is up for grabs. That the question of what kind of a signifier it is and what it attaches to is very much at issue in this play. I think that that that's that's really much the case. As yes, please. The, the problem I have is that in classical literature, uh, nobility never allows somebody to be a traitor. And, and here, here we have uh, Coriolanus cast as a, as a noble character, but he commits the greatest sin against nobility, which is being a traitor to his country. Well, uh, absolutely the case. But, but for him, you know, I banish you. The idea is that Rome has become a place of corrupt politics, that the only way to rid yourself of that 
is to get out of Rome, so to speak. He becomes the ultimate individual, um, and, and, and there's a tension between individuality and, and, and nobility. Uh, and, and that's, I think, what the... Yes, I think that's... that's the nobility here is a civic virtue or a, a social virtue. It's a virtue that has to do with a certain set of codes and a certain, we say it's loyalty. But I think that, that, that the scenes that we've looked at in which he feels betrayed by his mother, in which he feels jerked around by Meninius, uh, leave him unsure as to where, you know, the, the, what has happened to the Rome to which he thought he was going to be loyal. Uh, that he, he has no respect for the, for the citizens. He, the, these, these figures who are his parental figures, both of him urge him to behave in a way that is contrary to the nature that they have instilled in him, the very thing that they have taught him to do. And for them, it's a whole progress. They don't see that there's an inconsistency. He became a war hero. He was, brow was bound with the oak. Now it's time to become a political figure. He's going to get a, get a different kind of wreath and so forth. Uh, he, he doesn't see that this is part of a consistent plan. So, so the, the, uh, the, they precisely label him with the name of traitor at the end of the play. Word is all over at the end of the play. And he, it, again, he can't see the point of view from which he looks like a traitor. Uh, he's either blind to it or he sees through it. But that, let's, let's just look for a second at that unmasking scene, if we can, or whatever it is, the stripping scene. Um, Traitor, in the highest degree, he hath abused your powers. Traitor, how? That is what? I, traitor, Martius. Martius? I, Martius. K is Martius. Dost thou think I'll grace thee with that robbery, thy stolen name, Coriolanus, in Coriolis? You lords and heads of state, perfidiously he has betrayed your business and given up for certain drops of salt. What are those? The tears again. Your city, Rome. I say your city, to his wife and mother, breaking his oath and resolution like a twist of rotten silk, never admitting counsel of the war. But at his nurse's tears, he whined and roared away your victory. That pages, what, by, by pages, what is meant here? Pages blush at him. Sir, young boys. Again, Page is actually a young nobleman in training, but it's a, but it's a young boy again. Blushed at him, and men of heart looked wondering each at others. And now Coriolanus speaking to the gods. Near, hearst thou Mars? Name not th the god, thou boy of tears. I mean, it's, the insults just keep on coming. He's, I mean, he's as good in his way as as uh, uh, Volumnia is in hers. Ha! No more. Measureless liar, thou hast made my heart too great for what contains it. Boy, O oh slave, pardon me, lords, tis the first time that ever I was forced to scold. This is probably true. Your judgments, my grave lords, must give this cur, there it is again, the lie. And his own notion, who wears my stripes impressed upon him, that, he must, be, that must bear his beating to his grave, shall join to thrust the lie into him. Cut me to pieces, Volshi's men and lads. Stain all your edges on me. You know, come after me. Bring it on. That's what this is here. Boy, false hound. You have writ your annals true. Tis there, but like an eagle in a dovecote. I fluttered your revulsions in Coriolis. Alone, I did it. Boy. Why, noble lords, will you be put in mind of his blind fortune, which was your shame by this unholy braggart for your own eyes and ears? Then all of them together, let him die for it. Tear him to pieces. There's that sparagmos. Do it presently, right away. He killed my son, my daughter. He killed my cousin Marcus. He killed my father. Peace, ho. No outrage. Peace. The man is noble. There you are. His last offenses to, sorry, his fame holds in this orb of the earth. His last offenses to us shall have judicious hearing. Stand, Ophidius, and trouble not the peace. Oh, that I had him with six Ophidiuses or more his tribe to use my lawful sword. Insolent villain, kill, kill, 
kill, kill, kill him. It's an astonishing scene. It's simply a wonderful scene um, in which uh, he's the same character. I mean, this question about whether he learns anything in the course of the play, uh, it's hard to know. He's still uh, occupying that idealized persona that meant so much to him and that so many moments in the play have tried to strip away from him. Uh, whether it's a noble death or not, it's hard to say. But it's certainly uh, a moment of refusal to compromise, refusal to be stained by what he thinks is stained. Um, and he goes to his death uh, in a way the same figure that we met at the, I mean, having gone through all of these experiences, but as much in the same way that we could say that, that, that Lear is stronger at the end of the play than, than at the beginning. That, and, and indeed this kill, 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 kill him, uh, that we heard that line in King Lear. That's the, 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 uh, the, the, this iteration of the word, uh, the reduction, or you think of the middle of Othello where, where he is reduced to speaking words that have no syntax, that there is nose, noses, ears, and lips, and so forth. This, this, this repetition of a word that is in the place of language here. Kill, 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 kill him. Um, and then, stick with me for one more moment. Thou hast done a deed whereat valor will weep. So look at what's happened to those tears. Valor will weep. Tread not upon him, masters all be quiet, put up your swords. Uh, my rage is gone. I'm just going to read you the last, last paragraph. Hi, yeah. Okay. Um, Though in this city he hath widowed and unchilded many a one, including himself here, which to this hour be well the injury, yet he shall have a noble memory. Assist, that is, help me carry him out. Uh, the noble memory... Ladies and gentlemen, is you. The noble memory here is history, chronicle, poetry, theater. Uh, and this, this, is, this is another one of these moments at the ends of these plays in which the, both the question of what nobility is and the question of how memory changes as well as transmits history becomes an issue for theater rather than for chronicle. Uh, we'll talk next, after Thanksgiving, I guess, about Pericles, a romance, a very different kind of play, a play much, much more like a fairy tale, and I hope you like it. I do. Have a good holiday, everybody.